The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O Father holy, all creation offers praise. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O Father holy, All creation offers praise with the angels in heaven, with the cherubim and seraphim, with apostles, holes, and prophets. With the martyrs and your holy church, we sing in endless praise. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O Father holy, all creation offers praise. Creator of all things, O Jesus Christ, the Son of God, O Spirit most holy, To the Trinity most blessed, we sing in endless praise. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O Father holy, 
all creation offers praise. O Christ, King of glory, you became a man to set us free. You have risen to free us. And with all your saints in glory, we sing in endless praise. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O Father holy, all creation offers praise. All creation offers praise. All creation offers praise. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today is the 14th Sunday after Pentecost, and we see in our scripture lessons that the credit for our salvation goes to God alone. Our first lesson from Judges, chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. Then Jerubbaal, that is, Gideon, and all the people who were with him set out and camped by the spring of Herod. The Midianite camp was north of him, in the valley below the hill of Moreh. The Lord said to Gideon, There are too many people with you for me to give Midian into your hands. If I did that, Israel would glorify itself at my expense and say, My own hand has delivered me. So then, make an announcement for the people to hear. Whoever is trembling with fear can return home and fly away from Mount Gilead. Twenty-two thousand people turned and left. Only ten thousand remained. The Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many people. Lead them down to the water and there I will refine them further for you. If I tell you this one will go with you, he may go with you. But if I say to you this one will not go with you, he must not go. So Gideon led the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Place everyone who laps water with his tongue as a dog would lap to one side. Place everyone who kneels down to drink on the other side. The number of those who lapped, those who put their hands to their mouths, was three hundred men, while all the rest of the people knelt knelt down to drink water. The Lord said to Gideon, With the three hundred men who lapped, I will deliver you, and I will give Midian into your hand. As for all the other people, let each man go back to his place." The men who had been chosen took provisions in hand, along with their ram's horns. But Gideon sent every other Israelite man back to his own tent. He kept only the three hundred men. The camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. This is the word of our God. Our second lesson comes from Romans chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. Paul writes, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continuous pain in my heart. For I almost wish that I myself could be cursed and separated from Christ in place of my brothers, my relatives according to the flesh, those who are Israelites. Theirs are the adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, came the Christ, who is God over all, eternally blessed. Amen. 
This does not mean that God's word has failed, because not all who are descended from Israel are really Israel, and not all who are descended from Abraham are really his children. On the contrary, your line of descent will be traced through Isaac. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are counted as his descendants. For this is what the promise said, I will arrive at this set time, and Sarah will have a son. This is the word of our God. We sing the verse of the day in the hymnal. The Holy Gospel according to Luke chapter 13, beginning with verse 22. This will also serve as our sermon text this morning. He went on his way from one town and village to another, teaching and making his way to Jerusalem. Someone said to him, Lord, are only a few going to be saved? He said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door, Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. Once the master of the house gets up and shuts the door, you will begin to stand outside and knock on the door, saying, Lord, open for us. He will tell you in reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I don't know where you come from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown outside. People will come from east and west, from north and south, and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God, And note this, some are are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray. Heavenly Father, give us ears to hear and hearts to listen to your teaching. Amen. Recalculating. If you've ever driven with a GPS, you may have heard those words, re, that word, recalculating. If you took a wrong turn or skipped a turn you were supposed to take, and probably in your head you heard it with a little bit of a sigh. <sighs> Told you. Recalculating. And maybe that's why you don't hear recalculating anymore. Do you notice what happens if you take a wrong turn now, if you're using Google Maps? It doesn't say recalculating in that voice that I always heard as being so judgmental. It goes, boop, boop. It's subtle. It's kind. You didn't take the wrong turn. You just took a different way. And we'll find the way just fine. Just turn up here and there, and you'll get to the same destination. Recalculating has gotten really subtle. And that's great when it comes to driving. I'm glad to get where I need to go, even if I take a wrong turn and get a detour. Great. But subtle recalculating is not good when it comes to the church, when it comes to spiritual things. And recently, I think the church has been doing a lot of subtle recalculating, or at the very least, our hearts have. It used to be so obvious, didn't it? We're all trying to get to heaven. That's the destination we want to get to, and there's one way to get there, one direction, through faith in Jesus as your Savior. Boom, done, easy. Here we go. But recently, however subtly, church bodies, maybe churches, individual churches, or our hearts have been wondering, what if I take a little wrong turn here, a little wrong turn there? Can I still wind up in the same place? God, do I really have to just get to heaven that way? Maybe, maybe there's other ways to get to heaven, and, and like a subtle GPS, I'll wind up in the same place anyways. I say recently, but this isn't really something that's just become a question that the church has had. Ever since the very first church with two people, Adam and Eve, people have been asking God, really? When you said that, did you really mean that? And in our gospel reading for today, we have a question from someone, a question that could have come straight out of the 21st century. The guy says, Lord, are only a few going to be saved? That's a point where a lot of subtle recalculating has been happening, right? Lord, only a few are going to get to heaven, really? Heaven, hell, do we really have to talk about those places? Is hell even a real place? I don't really want to think about God sending people there. Lord, really? These questions can come from really good places. And maybe this person was being very concerned, thinking, Lord, you know, what about all those people? Well, that's not bad. But from the way Jesus answers him, we can tell that there was something bad going on in his heart. That behind all of this subtle recalculation, there was a sickness in his heart, a pride. And this is a pride that's in an every human heart. Because notice, Jesus doesn't answer just him. This man asks, Lord, are only a few going to be saved? And Jesus said to them, everybody there. And later in his answer, he says, I tell you, plural, all of you. Jesus knows that this person and everybody around him, whether they were disciples of Jesus or not, whether they were just interested bystanders or skeptical people who were critical of him, they needed to hear this answer. 
an answer that would lead them, that would lead everybody in the world to check their app or map to make sure that they weren't going into a spiritual trap because everybody, without Jesus' correction, would be heading this direction. And it's not the right way. So Jesus said, Strive to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. (laughs) He doesn't even answer his question, does he? Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And Jesus says, Strive. You're worried about them? I'm worried about you. Strive, fight, agonize to enter through the narrow door because lots of people aren't getting in. Recalculating. I don't know if any of you have ever done a corn maze. I have in grade school. We went on a field trip. Never again. We got to this corn maze, all these grade schoolers, and I was leading a little group here of my friends, and one of the kids took out a map. It was a little advertisement for the corn maze. It spelled out in big letters, corn maze, and the letters themselves were a maze. And so he had taken his pencil like the back of a cereal box and worked his way from the start to the finish. And he said, hey, let's follow this map. I know how to get to the end of the maze. And I said, that's just an activity for children. Put that away. It's not the map. Come on, follow me. He put it away, and I confidently led this group of grade schoolers in circles for hours until the sun was going down and we were all crying, convinced that we'd be stuck in the corn maze until our dying days. (laughs) And finally the workers came, you know, and gathered all the stragglers and we were fine. Jesus knew that this person asking this question thought he was leading the way, but in reality he had done some recalculating of his own And unlike with the GPS, when you recalculate spiritually on the way to heaven, you wind up going the wrong way. And so Jesus had to tell him, strive to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will not be able. What were his spiritual miscalculations? What are the spiritual miscalculations that wind up in every prideful human heart? Jesus explains it with a parable. He says, Once the master of the house gets up and shuts the door, you will begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open for us. He will tell you in reply, I don't know you or where you came from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I don't know where you come from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown outside. Jesus uses a man in the parable to describe what was going on in this man's heart and really in every prideful human heart by telling a parable about Judgment Day when the master, Jesus, will close that narrow door to heaven and people will come knocking saying, you should let me in. And in what this person says, you see why he thinks he should be in heaven. And it's not that he says, Lord, let me in through faith in Jesus. Notice what he says. Lord, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. Lord, we were around you. Remember me? I was that guy sitting next to you as you ate breakfast. Lord, you taught in our streets. I was there. I was listening. I know you. And Jesus says, I don't know you or where you came from. This person thought that because he was physically related to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers of his faith, that he would get into heaven. He thought maybe that just because he lived in the land of Israel, the promised land, which foreshadowed the promised land of heaven, that God would give him a free pass. 
Lord, let me in. I'm related to Abraham. Lord, let me in. I lived in the promised land. Lord, let me in. I heard Jesus talk once. I never knew you. And what is that sinful, prideful heart that says, Lord, let me in? It's nothing but evil. Depart from me, all you evildoers. This guy thought that heaven was filled with people like him, and he was worried about all those other people. And Jesus said, there's a place filled with people like you, and it's not heaven. You maybe have heard the joke. I'm sure it's a joke about every church body, but it's made about the wells too, that St. Peter is giving a tour through heaven, and the person's looking at all these doors, and as they get to one door, St. Peter says, shh, quiet as you pass this door in heaven. Why? The Wells Lutherans are in there. They think they're the only ones up here. It's a joke. But what's the truth behind it? Is that every single person by nature thinks, I'm the person who will be in heaven. I deserve to be in heaven, and it might be for reasons like that. Lord, let me in. I was a Wells member. Maybe I'll show up and say, Lord, let me in. I was a pastor. Lord, let me in. I was confirmed. I was raised Christian. Lord, I was in your church once. Lord, I heard your teachings. But if we knock and say anything but, Lord, let me in through faith in Jesus, that door is shut. Jesus says, I never knew you. Jesus says, there's a place filled with people who have been at church, who have been confirmed, who have been Wells members, who come up to my door and say, Lord, I deserve to come in, and it's not heaven. Recalculating. Maybe at this moment you know why Jesus used the word strive. Because this is hard to hear. Strive, fight, the Greek word there is where we get our word agonize because it is agony to come up to Jesus and have to set aside every thought in my heart that says, Lord, really? But really, Lord, you should let me or at least people like that in. Would you really send people to hell? Come on. Strive to push down that pride. And that pride, a lot of the time, will hear these words of Jesus and say, that seems so intolerant, right? Is it? Is Jesus intolerant? Is it intolerant of a high school to say you have to graduate eighth grade in order to enter this school? Is it intolerant of your body to get an infection and say, I don't want that in here? Is it intolerant of Kroger to have a sign up that says, this door is closed after 10 p.m., go through the other one? Well, it might be. If you come to the one door that's closed at 10 p.m., and so you run to the other one, and they see you coming, and they close it with a big piece of paper that says, ha! Well, then maybe it might be intolerant. But that's not what Jesus is doing here, is he? Notice in his parable, the door isn't closed yet. It's set in the future. Jesus isn't saying, I don't want you in heaven. He's saying, come this way to heaven. He isn't saying, the door is closed. He's saying, those doors are closed. Enter through me. Please enter through me. Does he look like someone intolerant at the start of our reading? Jesus went on his way from one town and village to another, teaching and making his way to Jerusalem. While this person is asking Jesus idly, are those people going to be saved? Jesus is busy saving them. He's going from town to town and village to village, no matter how small. No person is so insignificant. No person is so different. No background so strange that Jesus doesn't want to come to these people and say, heaven is open. Come. Come. Enter through faith in me. Because if there's one thing Jesus can't tolerate, it's the idea 
of people that he loves, people like you, not joining him in heaven. As he's teaching these things, where is he on his way? To Jerusalem. As Jesus teaches these words, he's heading to the destination that all of our proud spiritual wrong turns should take us, to hell. Jesus went there for us. He entered that broad way to hell on the cross and shut the doors behind him so that he would suffer for our sinful pride. Jesus on the cross suffered hell. He knocked on the doors of heaven in prayer. And what did his father say? I don't know you. You're an evildoer. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus suffered that hell because he didn't want you to. Jesus closed the doors of hell behind him so that you would only have one door to enter to heaven, that narrow door of faith in him. Jesus took away our sinful pride to give you his holiness so that when you come to the door of heaven and knock, God will say, well, look at that. You're first on my list. Through faith in Jesus, you look just like my son. Get on in here. Strive to enter through that narrow door because so many people go through it. Look what Jesus says at the end of the parable. People will come from east and west, from north and south, and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Will few people be saved? People from everywhere will be saved who enter through faith in Jesus, people from north and south, from east and west, will be able to find their way. The directions aren't hard. Turn right at Jesus and enter paradise. So like Jesus says, and like the apostle Paul says when he uses the same words, fight the good fight of faith. As Paul says later in Colossians, in Colossians, fight with the strength that Jesus himself provides. Fight to push down that proud part of the heart that would march up to heaven and say, Lord, I deserve to come in. And instead, come forward as the last person who deserves to come into heaven and see how Jesus will make you first in line. Jesus himself gives you the strength to fight this fight of faith He's been doing it today. We came in here, and what did we do? We confessed, Lord, I don't deserve to be in your presence. I'm a sinner. I'm the last person who should come. And what did Jesus say? I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're first in line. Come into God's presence. We didn't march in a church today to say, Lord, let me in. We said, Lord, have mercy. And through Jesus, he does. You're not going to march up to this altar because you deserve it or because you're worthy, but because Jesus invites people who aren't worthy to come forward and become worthy through his body and blood that he shed on the cross for you. Strive to enter through that wide open, narrow door through faith in Jesus. And as you do, as Jesus recalculates your heart every moment of your life, turning you back in the right direction, I think you'll find that you'll be too busy to ask the question, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Because you'll be too busy telling people where to go. Come, follow me. I know where to go. I know how to be saved. Let me punch the coordinates into your GPS. Come, follow me. I know the way to Jesus because the next turn is always faith in him. Amen. Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 6 says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. We'll now confess our faith in God with the words of the Nicene Creed. It's found on page 31 in the front of your red hymnal. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We praise your goodness, O Lord. For, fusta- for sustaining us day to day in all our needs of body and life, and for delivering to us your Son, that we may enjoy forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. We rejoice that you have granted to us the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, that we may not be without your guidance and gifts which direct us to heaven through faith in Jesus. We ask you to help us treasure in our hearts all that you have supplied for us and for our salvation. Deliver us from a judgmental spirit, O Lord. And give us always repentant hearts, that we not only cherish your gift of free salvation, but are also eager to share that gift with everyone we meet. Spread the gospel to the north, south, east, and west, and let your word create faith wherever it goes. Lord God, we join in thanksgiving with Dan and Lori Fine, who are celebrating their 45th wedding anniversary. What joys you have given them in this life, as they have loved, consoled, and supported each other. But most important of all, dear Lord, they have grown closer to you. You have taught them forgiveness and unconditional love. Keep them committed to each other and to you. Continue to supply their earthly needs according to your will and give them joy in the years to come through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who also taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. 